Hi attendees, a very warm welcome to the Healthcare Scholarships and Careers Fair 2022. My name is Serene, one of the scholarship officers with MOH Holdings, and I'll be hosting this session. So in this session, titled Health Tech for the Future, we have the following speakers with us. Eugene Tan, Senior Staff Nurse with Sing Health, Zhuan Tian Ko, Senior Specialist with IHIS, Tian Yi Lim, Software Engineer with IHIS, Miko So, Assistant Manager AIC, and last but not least, Tabitha Quick, Principal Prosthetist and Autotist, NHG. So after the speaker share, we'll have a Q&A segment whereby we'll answer questions from the floor. So before we commence, uh, please take note of this following housekeeping announcements. Firstly, in your event window, you'll be able to access the Q&A function. You may type your questions there for the speakers to answer during the Q&A segment. Do note that in the interest of time, we will only focus on the top voted questions. Should your question be unanswered, you may head on to the Q&A and event feed to ask them, or you may also drop us an email at talent.mohh.com.sg. Secondly, don't forget to check out the game section to participate in our quizzes and games to win attractive prizes. And lastly, a gentle reminder that although we have a leaderboard contest ongoing, please do not spam questions and ask stupid questions. So this is because it's for the benefit of everyone in the session. So without further ado, I would like to invite Eugene to kick off the session. Eugene, please. Okay, hello everyone. Let me just share my slides. Okay, can you see my slides? Okay, so uh, let me begin. So I'm actually Eugene Tan, a senior staff nurse at SGH, which is within Sing Health. So at Sing Health, nurses are the part of Sing Health, and SGH, where I'm currently uh, in, is actually an institution within the Sing Health cluster. So a little bit about me, my personal background. I've graduated from NUS in 2016, and that was actually under SGH sponsorship after which I was posted to the bone ward or orthopedics. And in 2018 to 2019, I actually took on an advanced diploma in orthopedic nursing with uh, Nanyang Polytechnic. And this was under an SGH scholarship. So around end 2020, I actually joined the nursing informatics team. And last year I had the opportunity to go for a six weeks online short course by MIT Sloan. And this was actually sponsored under the SGH Health Development Fund. So as you can see, there's actually a lot of opportunities for sponsorship and scholarship in Sing Health. So other possible causes that the nursing informatics nurses can go for include uh, overseas master's degree in healthcare informatics, such as at USA or Australia. Um, local and overseas conferences are available as well, such as the ACE conference and the Asia Healthcare Analytics Summit, which are currently held virtually due to the pandemic. And locally, there's actually an NUS master's certificate in nursing informatics, which we can go for as well. So at the photo segment, um, the top photo actually shows me with um, the IECG, where ECGs done by nurses can actually be synced into our system directly, where doctors can actually view it on the IECG system. And at the bottom uh, is me with another nurse. We're actually using the knowledge-based medication administration to actually serve medications to our patients. So just a bit more about the nursing informatics role at the left from the top uh, box. We do educate nurses on informatics-related nursing workflows such as the knowledge-based medication administration. We support nurses when they have queries on related nursing workflow or right side their technical inquiries. During new rollouts such as the medical device integration or the IECG system, which you saw just now, we do provide training and on-site support as well. And when it comes to documents such as nursing documents, flow sheets, and on the set, we do work with the nursing users as well as the technology staff to actually create or enhance them. And last but not least, a small part of our job includes some uh, basic compliance monitoring 
for adherence to related nursing policies. So currently, um, we are running out MDI, which has been around for a few years, but we are actually expanding it. This actually reduced the transcription work by nurses. For example, uh, in the past, the IACG system includes nurses printing out the ECG and clipping it onto the case file. And the doctors have to come to the ward to actually look at the ECG at the case file. But now with MDI, at least the ECG is sent straight into the system and the doctors can actually see it from their uh, working laptop, which they can see in any ward that they are at. We are also rolling out the iPad and iPhone communication utility to improve nurse-patient and nurse-physician relationship. This one I'll share a bit more about it later on. And some of us are actually involved in the Sync Health Nursing Informatics Council. So in the near future, some of us are also involved in the emerging tech and data track of the Sync Health Academic Medicine Innovation Institute. And in the long term, we actually foresee a greater support from NI required as technologies such as wearables and invisibles and AI strategies are extensively taken up as part of nursing solutions of the future. So back to the iPad um, app, it's called MyCat app. This is by the SGH Nursing Innovation and Transformation Team. So as you can see from the screen grab, um, patients can actually send their requests via the iPad, such as uh, some basic items such as water, pillow, or if they want their medication, and if they need help the toileting and so on and so forth. So this is actually for non-urgent requests. So I'll just go through the current workflow first. So currently nurse, uh, patients press the call bell, whether it's for emergency or for uh, small requests, and then the nurse will actually attend to the patient at the bedside. So in today's pandemic climate, uh, if it's an isolation ward, the nurse will have to actually gone up to her full, his or her full personal protective equipment before attending to the patient at the bedside. And then the patient actually verbalizes their request and then the nurse responds immediately or direct the request to the right person or get the items. But with this iPad nursing workflow, um, from the corridors, the nurse can actually receive the patient's request and they can read or reply if it's a communication matter. And also they can actually attend the patient afterwards. So as you can see, this actually saves one round of contact with the patient. And in today's uh, isolation, what climate. Actually, this actually saves a lot of resource and time. So next is also the uh, app allows the patient to review his, his or her uh, investigations done. For example, the vital signs readings that the nurses took, such as body temperature, pulse rate, blood pressure, were actually flowing into the patient's iPad. And the blood results were actually flow into the patient's health hub, as well as this MyCat app. So, um, for example, if the nurse took blood from the patient in the morning, in the afternoon, the patient can actually self-help and actually look into what the results of the bloods were taken. And it will also show the trend of the blood readings. On the right, it also shows the patient who is taking care of them, as well as any un unanswered questions that they have actually posed or answered questions as well. So this allows the patients to actually keep track and actually play a part in their health journey as an inpatient. So the actual potential advantages uh, besides reducing one contact of uh, one contact per patient request, nurses can actually also re uh, potentially receive alerts via the iPhone when there are critical lab results for the patients that they are taking care of. Uh, in other clusters as well, they have already started using the iPhone camera to serve to actually scan and verify the medication barcode. This can also be potentially used to actually take photos of wounds and potentially the wound photos can be compared to a wound directory to actually help the nurse identify the type of wound. So actually help to streamline our nursing workflow, help to add value to our nursing care, and potentially will give the nurse more time to stand with the patient at the bedside. So ongoing health tech projects, the medical device integration, which has been around SGH for a few years, is currently going to be extend, expanded to other areas as well. So MDI is actually um, a, a program that actually allows interoperability between medical devices such as vital signs monitor uh, and our electronic medical record, which means um, from the machine itself, when the nurse saves the vital signs, the readings will actually be sent straight into the electronic medical record, which actually saves a round of transcription. So because the data gets transferred seamlessly, this actually reduces the work 
load of nurses and significantly decreases transcription errors. So upcoming pro uh, health tech projects in SGH include the real-time location system. So this is already in place in another of our hospital at Sengkang. Um, so SG is going to roll this out as well. So the RTLS actually tracks exact locations of equipments and patients within the hospital in real time. So when it comes to say stock checking, stock picking, uh, nurses can actually just log into the system and actually find out where their equipments are. So this actually saves a lot of time and reduces the need for manual stock count of equipment. So I'm quite excited to actually be part of this and to actually see this being rolled out in SGH as well. So in closing, um, Sing Health is actually um, the largest healthcare cluster in Singapore. We have about 11 institutions under our care and we cater mainly to the eastern part of Singapore. So in Sing Health Nursing, there's a lot of opportunities. We have more than 30 nursing specialties ranging from palliative to oncology. So um, there's actually a lot of opportunities for you to develop professionally and actually pursue your career aspirations. You can also actually proceed to other tracks such as um, beside management, there's education, there's research, informatics is one of them, as well as being an advanced practice nurse. So if you are actually keen to pursue a nursing career with Sing Health, we actually do have healthcare spon uh, scholarships which will be shared more by our MOHH colleagues later, or as well as there's also cluster sponsorships which are available. So if you're interested, you can actually scan this QR code or actually contact uh, the email above. Otherwise, I'll actually hand the time now to Juan Chen, who is from IHIS. Yeah, thank you. Hi, um, hi I'm Jensen. Um, sorry. The admin, can I be able to share my video? Seems like I'm stopped to share my video. Thank you. Hi, Sari. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so let me share my screen now. Yeah, can everyone see my screen? Okay, thank you. Hi, so hi everyone. Uh, I'm Jensen. So thanks Eugene for the uh, introduction. So I'm actually a data science analyst at IHIS under the data analytics and AI division. So my journey with healthcare started in 2018 when I applied and was awarded the MOHH uh, Healthcare Graduate Studies Award, also known as HGSA in uh, business analytics. So prior to that, actually, I graduated from NTU School of Business and was working a few years in the tourism sector and the marketing research sector. But even when I was working in those areas, I have a keen interest in entering healthcare and serving the community. So that's whereby I was doing more volunteer work uh, during my free time at welfare organizations as well as IMH. Um, I was trying to find a way to merge my interests in healthcare as well as my skill sets in research and analytics. And that's when I came across this HGSA scholarship in business analytics. And I felt that it was a right fit for me. So after receiving the award, I took a master's of science in business analytics at NUS. And it, this course is actually an intensive one year program that advanced my technical skills in machine learning, statistics, data warehousing, and programming languages like Python and SQL. So after graduation, I joined IHIS in 2019, uh, where I could apply these skills I learned to look into building smart predictive models and also to add value to the public health sector. So let me share with you more about IHIS. So IHIS is the health tech agency for the Ministry of Health. <clears throat> We're actually the architect and implementer of IT systems that support the operations of all the public healthcare institutions, such as hospitals to polyclinics and GPs. <clears throat> so our mission is to digitalize, connect, and analyze Singapore's healthcare ecosystem. Um, so there are actually many de departments in IHIS including teams that look after day-to-day -day operations, system integration, cybersecurity, so on and so forth. 
So for my division at Data Analytics and AI, we aim to be forward thinking. So where we explore more and build innovative AI capabilities and collaborate with healthcare partners to uplift the analytics competencies of public health as a whole. So in essence, uh, my department looks at supporting these healthcare stakeholders to solve their business problems by using analytics to drive more insights. Um, we deploy the, the predictive models and run them at scale to the different at a national level or at an institution level. So let me share with you um, some of the past and present projects that I'm working on to give you a flavor of what I do day to day. So in general, I spend around 30% of my time doing project management, uh, such as connecting with the healthcare partners, trying to understand their business processes and requirements, and also testing our algorithms and solutions in their environment. Then I spend the remaining 70% of my time doing more of the technical work, such as uh, researching on the AI capabilities out there, uh, developing and piloting these algorithms using coding languages like Python and SQL. So I'll be sharing with you three key projects. Um, the first project I'd like to highlight is the project on automated textual analysis. So when we speak to healthcare partners, we found that many of them have a hard time trying to gather insights automatically from their unstructured data. Unstructured data such as um, textual survey feedback and verbal teams. So many of them are actually reading through these texts manually and spending a lot of time trying to like group or group them together to have a general sensing of what is what they're talking about in on the ground or in the surveys. So, so we leverage on natural language processing uh, and topic modeling algorithms to analyze this textual feedback automatically for topic as well as trending such as charts and visualization. Then we also work with them to test and implement on their data set and help them to improve productivity and try to uncover any new insights that they might have missed out, for example, during manual scanning of data. Then the other next two projects um, that I will be sharing is actually related to the COVID analytics work. So since COVID struck us in 2020, it had put a strain on our healthcare systems and hospitals. So at that point of time, um, we were working with CGH to understand and we understand from them that uh, eunomia, eunomia is one of the leading cause of death worldwide and also one of the main causes of deterioration in COVID-19. So we were thinking of how do we leverage on our predictive imaging capabilities based on chest x-rays. So we analyze and we feed in data and we train on imaging from chest x-rays to predict the patient's expected severity of pneumonia. So for example, we predict on their mortality and their likelihood to enter ICU. So with these prediction models, we can help to alert doctors to patients who might be likely to become critically ill and also enable prioritization of treatment resources. So this is a piloted and tested uh, on site. Of course, uh, this is more of a decision support and uh, the analysts, the, the radiologists were actually look at the prediction scores of the patients and then also make their own decision if um, what do we do next in their course of treatment. So we piloted this uh, model together with some model explainability, which means we will highlight regions where the model actually detect those as, um, you know, within the x-ray where it shows that they might be potential uh, pneumonia so that they can understand what the model is actually explaining as well. And then with that, we also publish several research papers with uh, CGH to share the knowledge, not just within Singapore, but also globally. Yeah. So the last project that uh, I would like to share today is also related to natural language processing. So in general, in terms of our healthcare data, other than structured clinical information and uh, images, we have actually a lot of rich unstructured clinical notes. So there's a lot of untapped potential to leverage on them 
um, as decision supports for our healthcare partners to provide be better quality of care. So for this project, um, we actually built a deep learning language model to try to extract you know, the drug terms and the adverse events terms directly from the clinical notes. So for example, the whenever we feed them in the clinical notes, uh, it will automatically tag where the names of the drugs are and the names of the AEs are. And then after that, uh, it automatically detect if there are any serious relationships, causal relations between the drug and adverse events that might be occur in patients. And it can help to um, inform authorities if there's the need to take note of anything and to safeguard the drug safety of our population. So it could be applied to any drugs that is selling in the market or even vaccines that our population are taking. So in general, these examples all show that analytics can have a real-world impact and in supporting um, public health um, initiatives. Yep. So this is the end of my presentation. I hope that my sharing today has been insightful to you and that uh, it lets you have a better understanding of the importance of IT and analytics to healthcare. Yep. So now I'll pass on to Tianyi for her sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Jensen. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. Okay, yeah, so, okay, I'll begin. So, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Tian Yi. I'm a software engineer at IHIS. And uh, I help to enhance existing IT systems and processes to shape the healthcare landscape in Singapore. So um, a little bit about me. Uh, I was uh, a computing student at NUS. Uh, I entered in 2017. And then in 2019, I received the midterm scholarship from um, MOHH SGIS. It's a scholarship under the MOH um, initiative where we are... Uh, part of the Singapore industries. Yeah, so I, I took that scholarship and then I joined IHIS as a software engineer. So I interned at IHIS last year, um, actually coincidentally at the start of COVID. So I have a lot to share about that. And then after that, uh, subsequently I graduated and then I joined IHIS last year in May. Yeah. Okay, so just a little background about uh, Singapore healthcare. Um, so, as you may, you may know or may not know, the public health care system has been regrouped into three clusters from, in 2017 from the existing six uh, systems. This to improve and future-proof the delivery of Singapore's health care services. So, in IHIS, right, our role here is to digitize, connect, and analyze all of the Singapore's healthcare ecosystems to enable the information exchange and cross-boundary workflows between each of all these clusters to uh, basically integrate into one nationwide healthcare. So um, other than that, we also help to build new and better systems to support the sim seamless transition from the six silos into three. Yeah, so um, other than that, at IHIS, we are also constantly innovating and adapting to the healthcare needs of Singapore. So obviously, COVID-19 uh, is without a doubt one of the most challenging times for us, even as a non-frontline healthcare worker, mainly is to, of course, build new apps to support our frontline workers and the new government regulations that keep changing. Right? So... Uh, so uh, next, I'll be talking about my career highlights. So um, I was actually fortunate enough to have played a part in during the COVID-19 fight at the start um, during my internship. So that would be the uh, slide on the, uh, the project on the left. So uh, my team was initially actually working on a long-term project, like the long-term for Singapore uh, like future. But after that, we were quickly pivoted to support um, COVID operations. So the app we built was mainly to manage the nationwide swab test. So when COVID first came in, right, all the nurses of different healthcare systems, they were like recording all the swaps in like spreadsheets. Like obviously there was no um, better way. So they were like doing that in like manual Excel, right? So they compile them every day to send to MOH. 
So this was a lot of manual work, obviously, like different, like the hospitals so big, like all of the levels, they have, they have their maintain their own spreadsheet and then they have to send to the healthcare cluster group, the head, and then the head sends to the, to the MOH office. Yeah, so this is a lot of manual work and there was too much room for inaccurate data because data was just being like copy and pasted. Like, this is the only way that was that they had. So um, my team, uh, we quickly took notice of this like gap like needed in our healthcare system. And then we worked through several nights to launch this new app in a matter of weeks, saving up a lot of the healthcare workers time. So uh, basically, if you can see from the small screenshot, uh, basically we record all the swab tests across the nation. And then there's a way to keep track. So if the laboratory like finish swab swabbing and like find out the results, right? The nurse don't have to like manually SMS the patient. Like it will just be auto key into to the system from the laboratory and then the patient will be notified. Yeah, so there's a lot of um, processes that were replaced by with this app. Lock. Yeah. So um, after I graduated, I joined back the same team who have gone to take on another project called One Rehab. This is the one on the right. So uh, what this project aims to do is to transform the rehab landscape in Singapore. So everyone knows that Singapore's population is aging and our healthcare services will have to ad adapt to this new need. Yeah, so currently, for example, if an elderly suffers from a stroke and is, um, goes to the hospital for uh, acute treatment, right? And then, for example, he or she discharges from acute care and then he or she will need to actually go through rehab to slowly regain like muscle strength and other abilities that you need for your daily lifestyle. So maybe he or she will head to like community hospitals and other service pro providers, you know, like below your HDB block, maybe there's like a San Luke elder care. So those are meant for like community care when you don't really need like um, a acute attention from like the hospitals uh, and like the big hospitals are like uh, SGH and all. So uh, then maybe like the nurse or the doctor at the community care will try to find out the history of the patient and like how did the patient like, like when did it happen and everything. Then the elderly will probably try to explain but couldn't like give like specific details and like, you know, that there may be some gaps like, that the nurse will have tr to try to guess and then try to provide a good like uh, service to the patient. So uh, what we are trying to solve here basically is to um, create like this seamless transition from like acute care to community care. And then uh, so that when the patient like, for example, discharges from like acute care, then he or she go to any community provider, community service provider. And then like maybe the, the nurse will check up like on the history of the patient and like this will all be like displayed properly and like there will be and then the nurse can for example refer the patient to some somewhere else and then the another healthcare institution can like find out like a like uh this patient is trying to come here for another service yeah so all this is to make it like very seamless there's no uh, like additional uh, processes or like gaps that like maybe like the elderly just can't like recover properly from a specific place and then they stop going for rehab and that'll be the worst case for us lah. yeah so that's what we are trying to solve here uh, yeah so that is all for me uh, if there's any questions I can answer later yeah uh, so now I can pass the time to yep uh, thanks, Yeni. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. here. Yep. Let me pull up my slides. Okay. I hope um everyone can see the slides. Okay. Uh. Yep. So hi everyone. Uh, I'm Nicole. Um, from Agency for Integrated Care (AIC). So um, I'm an Assistant Manager of AIC. La. And today I'll just share a bit about how it is that um, I came to join um, AIC under the MOHH SGIS scholarship and um, a bit more about some of the projects that I've been involved in so far that are related to health tech. Yep. 
Yeah, so um, maybe some brief background um, about myself first. Uh, so I actually joined AIC uh, in 2018. So it's been close to um, around four years since I've been with um, AIC. So um, some of you might maybe be familiar with the scope of work that AIC does. So it's really looking more at um, community care. Um, a bit related to, I think, what Tien was sharing um, earlier in terms of um, moving the care from a very um, acute and restructured hospital kind of setting into the community. So that is really um, the bulk of what AIC does. So um, for me, myself, um, I actually got introduced to this whole um, ILTC and comcare sector uh, actually through an internship uh, that I embarked on uh, during my first few years um, at university, actually. So that was sometime in 2015. Um, I had the chance to actually uh, intern with um, Renzi Nursing Home at that point. So for me, that was really um, an eye opener to like the, the community care sector at that point, trying to understand actually um, beyond um, the very acute setting whereby um, sometimes when people have um, acute sickness, when they get hospitalized, after that, what happens to them um, post-discharge? Um, do they maybe go into certain kinds of um, com care facilities? Um, or are there actually ways to help them to um, get well and also uh, to stay well uh, in the community, in the comforts of their own home? La. So um, that was kind of what um, got me interested into com care at that point. And um, which is why um, when I did actually apply for the Singapore Industry uh, Scholarship also, um, AIC was really uh, one, one of my top choices because I felt that this was definitely a meaningful sector to go into and something that I'm interested in. Um, so in terms of what I studied, um, I actually did psychology as an undergrad in NUS. So um, fun fact, uh, other than my main psych degree, um, I also did a double degree program uh, under NUS at that point. So I completed a liberal arts uh, degree as my second degree um, and spent uh, two years in Japan on that. Lah. So I guess with this mix of um, diverse background, um, eventually when I uh, completed my studies and joined AIC, uh, I was very glad uh, to be actually posted to the Caregiving and Community Mental Health Division. So really looking a bit more at some of the um, mental health um, programs and initiatives that is being de developed in uh, Singapore and um, really looking at how it is that we can strengthen community mental health. Yeah. So um, in the next few slides, I will share a bit on uh, my journey thus far and also some of the more health tech related projects that I've been involved in. So um, maybe firstly to start off, um, like I think COVID has definitely been something that has been coming up for um, quite, quite a few of the sharings. So um, similarly, like I think throughout the period since um, COVID hit, right, um, a lot of our, what we call um, our community mental health partners, the service providers, they were also um, definitely impacted by um, a lot of the measures that were being put in place. La. So um, together with these um, service providers, um, we actually explore into looking um, what are actually some of the other alternative mediums um, that would be technology enabled to help them to continue actually developing and uh, uh, to continue outreaching and also to deliver the help that they have been providing to their mental health clients. La. So um, this actually um, included things even like, you know, conducting um, social media outreach through uh, TikTok, through Instagram Live, and all really um, to make sure that during COVID, um, and I mean, a very stressful pandemic time, right? Are people still keeping well um, mentally? And uh, overall, how is this actually um, affecting their overall well-being? Uh? Yep. So um, this project was um, something that uh, kind of extends a bit even to this day, um, whereby we're actually seeing maybe, for example, some of these um, digital and able uh, mediums, could they actually be um, seen as ways in which we can continue to increase accessibility uh, to clients um, over time in a more sustained manner also. So um, the second project that I'd like to uh, share on is, I guess, slightly related also. Um, so really um, looking at understanding how it is that we can better support um, working adults' mental health in the workplaces. So um, like I think upon graduation, um, most people realize that actually you spend a great amount of time at work. And I mean, of that time also, um, uh, like more than half of your, your time in a day might maybe be caught up at work. So um, are there actually um, ways in which we can actually better support working adults' mental health? Like? So this is an area that um, I'm interested, I'm personally interested in. And um, specifically um, in the course of my work, um, I've also had the chance to actually work with some um, um, partners to actually find ways in which that we can actually enable this form of working adults, um, mental health help seeking through, for example, digital platforms or one-stop platforms that can actually um, provide them with, be it, for example, resources um, or services that they can access um, at their own convenience, uh, knowing that uh, someone who's at work might actually have a rather busy schedule. 
And then um, last but not least, um, maybe also to share um, a, a project that's a bit more, um, in a sense, corporate facing. So um, last year, I had the opportunity to be involved in um, one of AIC's um, corporate project teams. So this was um, really done with um, the intention in mind to look at how it is that we could digitalize some of the um, processes um, within AIC, or in a sense, also looking at just opportunities uh, for digitalization as a whole. So I'm um, using some of the design thinking um, principles, which um, me and my team, we actually went through um, a course on. We actually helped to identify what are maybe some of these um, be it systems, um, processes, or even like um, very um, specific human related kind of um, factors like, that we could potentially uh, digitalize um, in order to improve workplace effectiveness as a whole. So um, maybe just some brief thoughts to kind of um, summarize the, the, the work that I've been involved in also, right? Um, so perhaps maybe uh, slightly different from some of the speakers who have um, shared before, um, who might really be looking a, a bit more into um, the actual development or the implementation of the technologies themselves. Um, for me, my role in AIC um, really is more looking at the selection um, and also the piloting of certain health technologies. Uh. So through this, it made me realize that um, a lot of health tech and a lot of digital initiatives is really what we would term as an enabler um, because it helps to enable a lot of um, different kinds of work to be done and a lot of different initiatives that people might not have thought of like, previously um, without certain kinds of um, digital opportunities. Um, but that being said, uh, I also realized uh, through the course of doing all of this is that there are still challenges, definitely. So um, especially in the healthcare sector, right? Um, a lot of the time, sometimes we do um, hold rather sensitive data, for example, client information and all. So how is it that we kind of strike a balance between um, digitalization and also um, needing to ensure certain data security in place? Yeah, and um, last but not least, um, one, I guess, meaningful learning that I've kind of realized is that digitalization, digitalization is also very much actually a mindset. La. So beyond maybe some of the um, hardware or the software um, that we're actually um, putting in place, how is it that we try to get um, our colleagues, um, our service providers, our sector colleagues to really um, embrace digitalization as something that they can see as being helpful um, for them in the course of their work. La. Yep. So um, I think some of the projects that I've uh, shared so far are really actually still very much in more of the initial budding stages. Yeah, but I think um, these are definitely things that um, we will kind of hope to see can it further improve and help the sector as we go along. Yep, I think that's all um, from me. I will pass the time on to Tabitha. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll just share my slides now. Uh, thank you, Miko, for the uh, talk. As in, I think I really do resonate uh, quite a bit with some of the points that you've uh, shared with the group on like design thinking and uh, you know technologies and enabler. And a little bit about myself. I'm Tabitha. I'm the assistant head of the prosthetics and orthotic service at the Foot Candy Design Center of Tanoxin Hospital. Uh, I am a PO prosthetics, uh, prosthetics and orthotics by training. Uh, I actually graduated uh, from Strathclyde University uh, in 2012, so quite some time back, and then I started my uh, career with Tandok Singh Hospital, so I was actually awarded the MOH scholarship back uh, in 2008. And my presentation today is on technology in healthcare and looking at some of the user-centered um, smart solutions in the prosthetics and orthotics field. And so what is prosthetics and orthotics? So this is a, quite a niche uh, field, and it's composed of two parts. So I mean, the first part, of course, you've got um, prosthetics, uh, which is a specialty within the field of healthcare technology that is concerned with the design, manufacture, and application of artificial limbs. And the other part of the equation, which most people are not so familiar with, is that of orthotics. So in orthotics, you're looking at uh, braces and splints for the limbs and the spine. So there's uh, some little pictures here that uh, shows some of the custom devices that we uh, make as PNOs. So then who is the professional behind all this? Uh, uh, PNO is the allied health professional who is trained in the assessment prescription design, fitting, and adjustment of uh, prosthesis and orthosis. Right. So uh, what do we envision our future ready um, PNOs to be uh, besides you know, being uh, you know, a designer of devices? Uh, there's a lot of room for development in the different uh, fields for someone who aspires to be a PNO. Uh, so besides the clinical, as in we do envision uh, our stuff as innovators and being digital ready to adopt um, technology and the latest in uh, techniques to actually improve clinical care to the patients. And also, you know, there's roles in administration. So you do get the opportunity to sit on national committees and councils uh, to look into things such as operations and management, and also function as a business to business partner. So 
in uh, FLC in Tanok Singh, we have an on-site workshop that supports um, fabrication of customized devices uh, that are then supplied to different uh, front-end clinical spokes in different public health care institutions. Uh, and if education and teaching is your thing, uh, we do have um, you know, opportunities for you to advance that area to share that professional knowledge, not just within the profession, but also outside the profession so that everyone can learn and grow together. Uh, in terms of research, we do have um, projects that look at um, things like quality of life, data analytics, uh, population health initiatives, and also translational research. In terms of quality, um, there are also opportunities for looking into clinical quality of service, uh, lean management, value-based, and very systems level kind of changes in projects. I think uh, last but not least also, you know, as that collaborator and partner uh, in terms of your clinical work to um, provide that input um, on multidisciplinary or even transdisciplinary teams. Yeah, okay, so uh, just go through an overview of some of the smart solutions uh, in terms of health tech uh, in the prosthetic authority field. So our journey in, into um, 3D printing and digitization actually kicked off um, back in 2017. And what we were doing at that point in time was to try and digitize our uh, customized ankle foot orthosis product stream. So we started off with uh, FDM of use deposition modeling to produce the very first prototypes of uh, ankle foot orthosis. And if you fast forward uh, four years later into 2021, uh, you can see how the designs of the AFOs have actually changed. Uh, we have uh, optimized them in order to uh, you know, introduce this uh, product to a larger segment of the population by tapping on the latest um, technologies and materials. Uh, if you look at uh, things like CAD CAM, so using computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacture uh, to produce uh, some of our products, we have been uh, utilizing computer-aided design systems to produce our spinal orthosis for uh, children with spinal deformities back in 2018. And in 2019, we uh, procured a six-axis robotic cover machine, which helps us to carve out uh, some of the more complicated uh, reference modes for the manufacture of customized orthotics. So what about prosthetics? Uh, in 2018, we actually started our um, foray and rapid experiments into what we would call a user-centered design approach to produce uh, 3D printed non-metallic four-quarter prosthesis. And we have continued with these um, experiments in changing the way in which we deliver healthcare to our patients uh, by actually branching out into some uh, devices that are not traditionally under the umbrella of prosthetics and orthotics. So looking at things like adaptive devices for uh, personal functions, as well as adaptive sports equipment. Uh, some of our other digital product streams include the use of uh, scanners to produce uh, custom uh, orthopedic shoes, uh, waterproof prosthetic covers, as well as silicone hands and feet. Right, so uh, what does digitization look like in the P&O clinical context? So uh, I would like to put forward uh, the three smarts. So firstly, smart care. Uh, this involves integrating um, technology into our clinical practices. Uh, and then moving on to the smart design and manufacture. So tapping on uh, technologies such as CAD CAM and additive manufacturing technologies like 3D printing to design and manufacture these customized devices for patients. And of course, to support all these, you need a smart workforce that is equipped with the relevant uh, digital skill sets. So uh, as in some other speakers also talk about the iPads. So we do utilize um, iPads and uh, scanners quite heavily in our clinical practice. So uh, our clinician will actually bring the iPad into uh, the clinic room and this can be used to um, take a scan of the patient's uh, torso or body part that we are going to design the prosthesis or doses for, right? So uh, this design file can then be uh, imported into a purpose-built uh, CAD software where the P&O can digitally uh, manipulate the file uh, to produce the final um, design, which will then be sent to a smart workforce uh, who is trained with the skill sets to process these um, files and perform further bench testing and design optimization of the design file. So once the uh, design has been finalized, we can then tap on um, different smart technologies. So uh, in terms of um, CAM, we can use our 3D cover to cover out the reference modes, or we can also go straight to the 3D printing stage uh, without the need for a reference uh, mode to create this device. So once the finalized device uh, comes back to our clinic, our p is then able to fit it uh, to our patients. All right, so uh, I'm going to zoom into 3D printing for the rest of the talk, uh, some of the projects that we have done so far, and how we envision a digital ecosystem, you know, as in what does it look like in the Singapore healthcare context uh, with reference to um, the p o field. So I think the beauty of um, 3D printing and digitization is that uh, it sort of frees you from all these physical constraints uh, because you can send um, information uh, and, and design files you know, remotely to different collaborators and partners, not just within the healthcare industry, but also outside the healthcare industry. 
And these industry partners don't have to be uh, local. They could be someone we work with um, overseas uh, for a specific um, area of knowledge. So um, how it would uh, look like is that at the front end in the clinic, uh, the PNO would be doing the physical and clinical assessment of the patient and come up with the design prescription for the prosthesis or the orthosis. And then of course they would uh, take the scan of the body part that they want to make this device for. And this scan can then send me through a secure cloud uh, to a facility that is equipped with um, software for 3D design rendering. So how this plays out in um, practice is that it could be performed by a clinician, so a P&O who is trained in uh, these digital skill sets could perform that design rendering. Or we could also work with our uh, engineering partners and uh, overseas um, collaborators for this uh, bit of the process. So uh, the final design file can then be sent to um, the 3D printing with an industry partner. Uh, so if you look at the two uh, product lines on this slide, on the left-hand side, you've got the 3D printed um, AFOs. And for this uh, product stream, we don't work very closely with a local uh, additive manufacturing company. So it's 100% produced in Singapore. Uh, and what's new for 2022 is this project that we are doing uh, on 3D printed prosthetic sockets for trans amputees. And our collaborator for this uh, project is actually based in Europe. So you can see with um, 3D printing and digitization actually opens a lot more uh, opportunities to, in a sense, bring the best uh, technology as in to bring the world uh, and roll out that care, that center of care to our local patients. So once the device is 3D printed, it then gets sent back to our workshop uh, in Tanoxing for some final touches before we dispatch it um, back to our clinic front end. So uh, our clinic front end uh, includes our on-site clinics at Tanoxing. It also includes our uh, partners in the other restructured hospitals. So um, we do support uh, some of these initiatives at uh, KK Hospital and also at Kodekwat Hospital. So um, the patient is able to receive um, right-sighted care and this care is accessible to them. And so some uh, of the other uses of 3D printing is that it's actually uh, starting to change the way in which we deliver care to our patients. Uh, so traditionally, um, healthcare tends to be uh, quite prescriptive. So if a patient comes to you with a clinical condition, you know that uh, based on your assessment, there are you know, certain solutions that you can uh, provide for this patient. Uh, what 3D printing has done is to actually open that up into a process that we call user-centered design. And as the name implies, user-centered design actually puts the patient um, back to the center of care. Uh, this is a reiterative process uh, that co-involves the patient uh, along with the clinician in the design uh, process of their you know, prosthesis or the orthosis. And how 3D printing helps with this is that if you look at this little uh, dotted box over here, uh, this is a reiterative um, process uh, that harnesses the advantages of 3D printing in terms of it's really, really easy to uh, produce functional prototypes at a relatively low cost. And because you are able to produce functional prototypes, what you then get is that uh, valuable feedback from the patient in order to improve on your design. So the patient would try out the prototype, they would give you feedback on you know, what works for them, what doesn't work, and the clinician can then uh, go back to the digital design file and tweak the design until uh, the final product is ready to be delivered to the patient. So just share this uh, little case example of one of the uh, first few experiments that we did in looking at this user-centered design process. So user-centered design um, actually starts off with uh, really understanding the patient needs and context so that the eventual solution is tailored and it's very uh, unique to that individual person. So it starts off with um, some data collection. So uh, we had this patient here who had a spinal cord injury and he was reliant on a hand splint to actually um, void his bowels. So um, in addition to the functional needs of the splint, so things like very practical, uh, things like durability, you know, hygiene, portability, and ease of use, I think what the interviews um, showed up was some of the softer um, sides of the equation. So you would find out that what the patient really want uh, of this splint is that you know, it enables him to be independent in terms of his personal function, which can be uh, very empowering for uh, patients with physical disabilities. So we took a scan of his existing splint. He had a working um, prototype, but it wasn't as durable. And we brought it uh, then to our you know, service engineers and uh, designers at our innovation lab uh, to look into how we could uh, marry technology and uh, the clinical aspects into a holistic solution for the patient. Uh, and this is the first prototype that was printed out. Uh, it was printed uh, via the FDA method uh, out of a material called polylactic acid. 
And uh, the patient is right now in this, um, he's gone through, I think it's coming to the third round of this iterative process and we are quite close to um, delivering the final um, device. So uh, what we learned um, is that, you know, there's a lot of cross learning and cross pollination of ideas across the uh, different industries. So as in when we uh, speak to the engineers, as in as clinicians, we will find out uh, things that we might not really have considered uh, coming purely from the clinical point of view. And also, um, you know, very little things that matter to the patient, which influence their eventual acceptance of the final uh, product. So things like, you know, the color as in, uh, sometimes we don't really think about the color and the appearance of the, the splints, but uh, to the patient, um, these could have very, uh, quite a lot of significance. So some of the other um, user-centered uh, design uh, projects that we've done, uh, I mentioned the non-metallic four-quarter prosthesis. So this was uh, back in 2018, and it was uh, 3D printed to meet a very specific uh, set of needs for this particular patient. Uh, what we actually managed to do for him is that we 3D printed a customized elbow joint that is not uh, commercially available uh, in the prosthetic market. And what we uncovered is that you'll find that even little things like the holes uh, that were printed into this prosthesis, so the size, the location, all these are very deliberate uh, and based on the feedback that the patient provided to us throughout that uh, reiterative process. So the holes were actually um, positioned and sized to uh, balance out some very specific needs of uh, the cosmesis of the prosthesis and also the breathability and the weight um, of the prosthesis. And we've also done an arm autoprosthesis for a, a patient with an upper limb uh, syndrome. And 3D printing and digitization has also allowed us to uh, move beyond the, you know, what we are traditionally uh, trained to do as a P&O in uni uh, and moving into um, different uh, fields beyond um, the traditional so um, such as making adaptive sports equipment um, for patients. And all these requests are really very unique and it is 3D printing and technology as an enabler that has actually allowed us to um, do this. So I would just like to end my presentation by uh, you know, saying that technology is really an enabler. I think most people tend to uh, see technology, digitization uh, and the human touch as two opposing poles. So, uh, but I think our learnings and uh, to um, follow on what Nicole has um, presented on is that, you know, these two fields don't have to be mutually exclusive. And in fact, technology is that enabler to uh, foster those connections. And by marrying, you know, the clinical sites and the healthcare technology sites of the equation, we are then uh, better able to provide a more holistic form of care to our patients, uh, which I think as healthcare um, professionals, um, when we enter this field, uh, first and foremost, it's born of the desire to um, provide care to help others. And technology is just the enabler that allows us to uh, perform our job better. Thank you. Thank you so much, speakers, for your insightful sharing. So now I'd like to request for every all our speakers to turn on their videos and we will start the Q&A portion. So my first question that I have will be posted to Eugene. So Eugene, uh, do nurses in nursing informatics work office hours or shift work? Secondly, what is the typical work day like? And lastly, uh, do nursing informatic nurses have clinical time or contact time with patients? So there is a three-part question. Yeah. So Eugene, please. Okay, so uh, firstly from SGS itself, we actually do shift work. So we do, uh, morning shift 8 to 5 or p.m. shift 12 to 9. So this actually allows us to cover the evening shift medication rounds. So even after 5, if the wards have any questions for us, they can actually call us through our contact and then we can actually support them. And also over the weekends, we do have uh, uh, Tiger Connect, which is actually an app that all healthcare professionals use. So we do have actually uh, group chats with our informatics liaison nurses from the wards. So if they have any urgent questions to nursing related workflows, they can actually check with us. And during actually major downtime or maintenance, we actually do provide night shift support as well to help them with the workflow. So actually we don't work office hours. 
However, for some other institutions or hospitals, maybe they have a much smaller team. Like some of them only have say three um, nurses in nursing informatics. So for that, I believe um, more of them will actually be more of uh, office hours. For example, if they are based in the center, say National Cancer Center or National Heart Center, then those places actually predominantly uh, is more of an office hour setting. So it makes more sense for their NIs to actually be uh, working office hours. So for typical workday, um, we do generate our reports. We do actually uh, answer calls and actually help to address the nurses' uh, workflow issues. Some of us are actually involved in the medication uh, events committee. For example, when uh, something happens, uh, it's not really just about the human factor, it's also about the system factor or the environment. So we also go and check whether is there anything that can be improved in the system to actually uh, help to reduce such cases uh, of issues. For example, um, taking a patient's blood type, which is known as a group and cross match, actually requires uh, two nurses to actually uh, come together and verify and witness that the blood is actually taken from that patient before we send off. This is to ensure that the right patient blood group is being captured. So right now, um, Sinkai has really rolled out the EGXM and SG is, is going to roll out as well, where through the system, we actually verify the patient's identity, two nurses sign in to make sure that they verify that they witness the patient's blood is being taken from this patient at the bedside, and then we'll send them out for testing to actually make sure that it's close to 100% accuracy that the blood type that we actually receive really belongs to the patient. And currently due to more um, swing wards, where we actually swing our wards to cater to pandemic situation, we actually do provide more support to the ground by actually helping to check the equipments as well to make sure that if it has been closed for a long time, then everything is actually turned out on the system and software actually being um, updated before the nurses actually use. Uh, so because of IT security, um, not every nurse have access to the devices in every ward. So when they are actually deployed, we'll make sure that their uh, accounts and accounts are actually able to access to those areas that are, they are being deployed to. So in terms of clinical time and contact with patients, um, we actually do one day a week in the clinical setting. So uh, it varies. I have colleagues who are from the operating theater background, so they'll go back to the operating theater. Some are from the emergency department, some are from the wards, and one of them even um, is trained in chronic disease management. So she actually joins the community nursing team on her clinical days, and she's actually posted to the community nursing post on her clinical day. So it actually gives us a lot of insight into what the nurses are actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And then we can also provide uh, support when they actually need. And currently due to the COVID situation, also I will be deployed soon to the COVID ward for <clears throat> um, almost full time. So that is actually part of what we do as well. Um, in terms of when there's a national crisis, that will actually uh, help out to augment the manpower workforce. Yeah. Thank you so much, Eugene. Uh, the next question is for any of the speakers to answer. So do you need to have a good IT programming or statistics knowledge before going into health tech? See some smiles. <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, I can take the questions first. Um, so, so my team, at, so at IHIS, I think that the, because we are more of the IT technology arm. So in general, I think um, uh, any, as long as a degree in like computer engineering or computer science or even related to you know analytics work it's actually a starting ground to you know to apply for any of the programs that we have and roles we have in IHIS so um, it really depends on your interest uh, to see which area are you more involved because IHIS is, has many departments as I shared if uh, let's say you'd like to have more business uh, cus like you know facing customer facing role with the healthcare institutions to really understand and gather requirements, we also have that track. Uh, so I, I believe those will be more of a project management role. Then uh, let's say if you are uh, more keen into developing your technical skills, such as uh, the team that are in, in data science, uh, then we will be more involved in looking at the technical skills that you have. But of course, um, as long as you have a degree in that and during you know, interviews, you share your, your experience and your keen interest in why you want to join healthcare, 
and also like um because of you know why why healthcare and the tech skills you have, I think that would be a good age for you as well already. Yeah. So um a lot of the things that I do, uh actually I learned on the job. So as you know, my background is actually my first degree is not in uh it's in a non-IT um degree. Um I only learned about all these like technical skills in my master's program in the one year intensive course. So a lot of the skill set, for example, understanding of the data structure of you know the complexity of healthcare is all learned on the job. So I believe as long as you are um you know you have the initiative and you have the keen ability to learn, I think that is a good enough uh, for you to kickstart. And of course to learn with your from your colleagues, uh, you know, during your free time, a lot of times we also do a lot of our own research to read to read out of the technical skills. I think that is how we try to tee up our own knowledge and apply them in the projects that we have. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, maybe I'll chime in from the clinical side. So uh, I think uh, Jensen has, uh, you know, expressed the point of view from the, you know, from the technical side. Uh, and I think as clinicians, like, uh, we do come in and I do see a question for me also, like, you know, how I specialize in the tech side of P&O. Uh, I think the nature of our profession uh, in itself, it's already quite technical to begin with. Um, it's very hands-on. Uh, and so it actually a lot of it, it whether it's the hand skills in the conventional process or this uh, more tech side, you know, health tech, it's uh, a lot of on-the-job training. It's not something that would be um, taught in the uni. So I would actually uh, second um, the, you know, the, the sentiments that are expressed that, you know, the most important thing is actually having that uh, open mind and the initiative to learn and, and to, you know, when you go into these kind of projects to uh, have that, uh, a lot of it would be self-directed as and I think you do have to have that uh, interest in uh, you to want to try and identify those gaps uh, in your knowledge and do some background reading on it. So you may not have the same amount of specialist knowledge as, um, say, uh, you know, an, uh, mechanical engineers who we work with um, quite closely for some of these uh, things, but I think what you can do is to bring your uh, clinical experience, which is the other side of the equation, to then uh, help them to uh, develop a product that takes into account these factors which they are not the subject matter experts in. So there's a lot of um, co-sharing and learning together with the uh, different um, parties that you're um, you know, liaising with and discussing with on these projects. Thank you so much, Tabitha. Since you are here, so maybe I can just follow up with that question. So the question that, um, that was posted is, is it challenging to be both a clinician and also be involved in the technological side of um, this P&O aspect? Uh, okay, so I, I think in, uh, so in uh, Tandok Singh itself, we actually do have four checks for development. So um, these are clinical um, research, um, education, and some management. So I think uh, if you look at all the four tracks, actually what underpins of them is actually that clinical knowledge uh, and that practice. So uh, it's just how you apply um, that into the different tracks. So uh, even if you're on a research track on like a tech track, uh, what you're actually doing is um, translating that knowledge to improve clinical care for, for your patients. Uh, I do admit that as the head of service, I... I have to wear uh, quite a lot of hats. So uh, looking at things like service delivery provision, and then of course my own clinical work and uh, research into all these um, tech things. So uh, quite a bit of time management uh, skills that are involved in it. And yeah, as in, it, it, it is a challenge to juggle sometimes, uh, but <laughs> I think you, as one, once you um, gain experience uh, and you know, get used to the job, uh, you will find your own ways of coping with it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, the next question will be to Miko and also Tian Yi. So why did you choose healthcare IT and not in an another industry? Tian Yi, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess, actually, initially... Um, especially because I came from JC, right? And then the usual JC kid probably doesn't know what he or she wanted to do next time. You just like study the usual like A-level um, courses and everything. So even up until like I took my A-levels, I didn't know what field I wanted to be in. And then uh, so I just went around, uh, went to open houses and see. And honestly, 
tech was like the last thing in my list because like I was just like I'm not a nerd like I don't want to do this like I was, I was like oh I could take business or whatever but then the thing is um there was no special like I didn't find any calling at first and then I went to the and then like it was reaching the end of the open house. Then I went to the computing booth. I was like, hey, this is pretty interesting. There was like only one girl. And then she saw me. She was so excited. She was like, oh my God, you want to join computing and everything? And I was like, ha ha ha, uh, you can talk to me. <laughs> like, I'm, I can be your listening ear. Then after that, then like, she explained, explained, explained. So I got really like, um, I was like, wow, this coding thing is pretty cool. But then like, uh, so when I joined computing school, uh, and again, I didn't know where I wanted to work at or I was just like, um, it's like, huh, do I really want to be like, uh, like facing like robots and everything? It's not really my thing or so. And then uh, I chanced upon like the healthcare uh, scholarship. I was like, it hey, is pretty cool because it's not just um, computing domain. There's also the healthcare part. So like my users are not really like, uh, like, people that I cannot see or like consumers or whatever is like actual users needs so like everything that I could is like based on what a nurse need or like or the nurse is like oh like um I I have this like problem like do you think like you can help me like automate like immediately like send to the other hospital or whatever but I'll be like sure like oh then I um because I do front end also front end is like basically uh, there's back end and front end. Front end is like the front facing like what the user sees. So uh part of my job I also like participate in like user acceptance test basically it's like any new projects the uh, end users will try to test and see whether they like it or not then like i'll suggest to them like oh do you like this better or whatever like like better so like i find that it's a very like meaningful job and not just like i don't know hit kpi i don't know i don't know what the uh, <laughs> other people do so yeah i just think it's pretty meaningful like so good uh coincidence that I chance upon this scholarship, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Chenny. Mikkel? Yeah. Um, for me, uh, actually, I'm not sure if it's okay, but um, I was thinking, like, maybe uh, in response to this question, right, maybe I could also kind of share a bit on, like, not just healthcare, but also, like, really community care, right? Because, like, I think this question did actually remind me um, about my experience when I first, um, like, Enter this sector also la. So, um, one comment that 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 I remember, um, I'm not sure if it was at my interview stage or or potentially um um like during the orientation like when I first joined um AIC and all, um, was that people actually said that um, um community care even though you might see it as a so called sunset industry, whereby people are like in a sense nearing maybe possibly the 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 later years of their life. Um, that they will be receiving community care. But actually, a lot of the times, it's actually not the sunset industry. It's the sunrise industry because Singapore with its aging population, um, with the also increasing acknowledgement that we actually need to shift the care from just the acute settings to the community, right? Um, this is actually um, a place whereby um, there'll be increasing demand, um, increasing usage in future. And to me, that was something that really spoke to me la, at that point. So I thought that um, this is something that is seems to be aligned with the future that we're moving towards, I mean, as a nation. So um, definitely it's something that has a lot of potential in it. And I think um, really the role for IT in it, um, I guess maybe a bit similar to 10 years. So this was definitely wasn't something um, that I really saw myself doing um, at, at the very start of like my career or even like, you know, when I was in undergrad and all. Um, but as I started um, getting involved and, and get and speaking to really people who are in the sector. La. Then we realize how important it is um health tech and IT is in that um a lot of the things that we are doing actually cannot move as well or as fast if let's say there are not certain um enablers in place, la, which is mainly um some of the IT infrastructure, which to be very honest is sometimes always um not always put in place. La. So we do have people who are still doing very like manual kind of like Excel sheets, um, Google Forms, that kind of thing. So to me, I think um a lot of the interest is about how, how it is that we can actually build um, better systems that can really help everyone to um, deliver better care. La. Yeah. Thank you so much, Miko. Jensen, would you like to chime in for why you chose healthcare IT? Yeah, sure. So, um, so because I, um, health, um, in a sense, healthcare is not the first industry I worked in. So I did, ex at least I kind of like have experience in you know, other industries like tourism or, you know, research. And I think all along, um, 
uh, because of my voluntary work and also, um, you know, my calling in a sense, I just know that I wanted to do more impact in, in helping the, you know, in, in a, in a more direct way to help uh, people. Cause whenever, when I feel like I was in another industries, we were really very focused on like, you know, what team was mentioning more of like, uh, hitting some, uh, more KPIs, you know, we have commercial targets and a lot of, uh, you know, dollars and cents involved. Whereas, but, um, so I wanted to see how I can, you know, find a career where I can merge both, um, you know, the technical aspects, aspirations that I have, and yet try to have a better, more impact on uh, what I do. And I can, you know, really see the impact and work directly with, uh, you know, like users, like, you know, the clinical clinicians to, to, to support them in what they do. So that's why I decided to uh, take a, you know, second uh, degree to, to, to try to, that, to do that. So I think, I just feel like there's, there's not too late. So even if there are people, you know, if, you know, like recent graduates, after you get into a certain industry and you do want to move into healthcare, I don't think that it's too late. And, and um, I find that, you know, there's always a lot of opportunities out there. Uh, be it, you know, the scholarships over here you have, or, you know, just going directly to the careers to, 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 to do that. And so I think, I think I don't, I, I'm enjoying what I'm doing now. And I find that, um, you know, whenever I can merge these two together and every day, everything, whenever I do a code, like for example, like what he said, like I know that directly that it's going to be contributing to something that uh, the users are doing. I do feel like uh, fulfillment. I think that's one reason why I do choose health tech. And also, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, one more thing I want to share is also health tech is actually also a, it's an increasing important area and it's actually emerging because if you think about it, there's the multifaceted uh, way of doing things. For example, we have so much um, things that we can contribute to improve this area because I think that there's really a lot of uh, opportunities out there that if you join in, there's many areas that you can do more into. So I find that it's also because it's the emerging technology. So anyone who's interested in, you know, Doing that is also some, there's already a lot of, I mean, if you join health tech, there's already a lot of places that you can explore. So I think that's also an area that I'm really very happy with. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I think this, uh, the next question relates to Mikko's and Tabitha sharing on how technology is actually an enabler. So this next question is to both our clinical staff, so Eugene and Tabitha. So will technology make healthcare professionals work redundant? Okay, I'll go first. So from the nursing perspective, I don't think it will be redundant. So as what Tabita mentioned, it's actually an enabler. So there's a lot of things that can be done that actually uh, helps the works to be smoother, but ultimately you may still need some people on the ground to actually uh, carry out the things that cannot be automated. So for example, what I learned in the MIT Sloan um, AI in healthcare course, they actually managed to use uh, machine learning and AI programs to actually interpret um, x-rays and then they can actually see if the patient actually has cancer or not. So they actually put in a lot of parameters and they actually um, compare it to actual clinical evidence and actually see whether or not um, the x-ray actually shows cancer or not. So while it does seem like uh, eventually if this is um, very successful, maybe radiologists will no longer have a job, but actually you still need a doctor over there to actually follow up with the patient and actually confirm the results. And then also advise on what is the next plan of action to do. So while it does help a lot when actually we actually can standardize the diagnosis of cancer from the x-rays um, through software and AI, but you actually still need a doctor inside to actually make sure that um, the overall care for the patient and the patient's journey is actually complete. So back to nursing also, um, maybe in Japan, they have some uh, so-called machines that you can just put the patient inside and then uh, the machine will help to bathe the patient, wash their hand or that, dry them. <laughs> but ultimately, you still need a nurse to bring a patient from a bed to the machine, right? <laughs> and then also in terms of human touch care, I think that cannot be replaced. So it does uh, enable our jobs to be smoother, to be better. For example, with MDI, we reduce uh, manual tasks such as uh, transcription work. And also with tech, the doctors and nurses don't have to say, 
in the past, we only have a case file. So if the patient goes for an X-ray, the case files follows the patient. But with tech, um, any doctor or nurse from whichever computer they are from, they can actually assess the patient's uh, clinical data and even have context switch to other things such as um, doing AIC referrals or looking into their data from NHR. Yeah, so I would say tech will really enable a lot of things, but it will not make us redundant, not for the next um, maybe half a century. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think you just said my two cents. I, I don't think you'll ever be able to replace uh, you know, that human connection and the human um, touch, which I think is a sentiment that has been uh, echoed by all the panelists here. So even if you approach it from a, you know, that data science, uh, that technology aspect, right? As in, you still see that the motivation is very much uh, you know, wanting to make a difference in uh, people's lives. So there is that human connection, that uh, one for you know, that uh, human to human uh, kind of interaction, which uh, I don't think will ever be replaced. I think as humans, uh, innately, we are wired to seek out those, um, those connections. Uh, so uh, technology is really um, an enabler. Uh, it's a tool to add to our um, toolbox of techniques in you know, providing that care to the uh, patient. It does not actually uh, replace the uh, value of the healthcare professional. And I think because you know, technology, in the end, it's a tool, uh, what you do and it's the application um, that actually makes the difference. Uh, how you apply this um, to and the technology to the different contexts. So you would need a human um, to make those um, judgments. Uh, what value the clinician brings is actually in terms of their clinical knowledge um, to bring those um, judgments, like you know, as what Eugene has said, you know, to interpret the results and to uh, you know, personalize the care to each individual, which is something that I think uh, you know, at this point in time, um, technology and machines aren't yet able to do. Thank you so much, Eugene and Tabitha. So next question is for anyone to answer. Uh, given that health tech is such an interdisciplinary field, so it, it covers across technology, engineering, medical knowledge, etc. So what is your biggest challenge after you have entered this field? Uh, yeah, I, I think I'll just kick off. Uh, I think because it's such an interdisciplinary field, right? and definitely you come into uh, contact with uh, people from different departments, different backgrounds. And I think for uh, a lot of clinicians, like when they're first thrust into this uh, field and suddenly they have to um, deal with, say, like engineers or uh, systems, uh, people who create the systems. And it's a very, very different uh, mode in which we approach um, the same um, issue. So uh, there is that uh, difficulty as in it's a challenge to, I think, uh, take a step back and try and see things from uh, the point of view of the other um, parties who are coming to it. So uh, one, of our, one of the things that I find that our clinicians uh, struggle with a little bit is that in this whole uh, aspect of design thinking, uh, traditionally we're not, I mean, we're not engineers and we, uh, we, don't, we didn't come in as engineers. Uh, we are clinicians uh, by uh, training, even though our field tends to be uh, more uh, specialized in health tech by nature. Uh, we are still at heart, we are clinicians. So it's really, when, when we deal with the engineers in terms of like designing the uh, products, you find that it's a very different way of approaching the, uh, approaching the issue. And I think it takes um, some openness and communication from both sides to actually take that step back and uh, to see how the other party is approaching it and to find that uh, common ground to co-collaborate and derive the solution together. So it's a lot of uh, uh, putting aside your um, preconceived um, notions when you come to the problem to uh, look at it from the different uh, perspectives. Anyone else wants to answer this question? Yeah, so um, I agree with Tabitha. So I think from our point of view where, you know, we come in from the IT aspect first, I think understanding the, you know, the clinicians, uh, because they have the domain knowledge and I, I think as users we, we always try to think from being in their shoes like what is their needs and you know their issues that we want to solve so I think that would be one of the key and most important thing that you know even us when we want to develop you know something for them to to, to be to be able to do that uh, more effectively so I think other than design thinking we always try to have you know user sessions really to to let's say you know uh, we, we, we can have, you know, flip charts, boards, and then trying to understand their journey. And then after that, we'll try to take it back to, to 
tied with the technology as well as the data available to see if something works for them. I think it's a very iterative process. Like, um, so be whether you're coming from the clinician's point of view or the IT perspective, um, I think understanding, we need to have open mind to really uh, understand how uh, each side works and, you know, understand the constraints together as well as how can we, you know, pull out some opportunities from there. So uh, I think that is one of the uh, key challenges as well as something that's most interesting that we can do for the users. And I think secondly is also the, the massive of the data available. For example, um, I think from the user's point of view, the front end that they see that we normally develop for them is maybe more intuitive and user friendly, but there's a lot of works behind the back end that needs to be you know, tie in and connect together to pull all the data seamlessly through the systems to, to support the clinicians as well as uh, you know, the healthcare providers. So I think another challenge that we will have to do is to, to think about how do we migrate and you know, combine and merge all these different uh, data sources that we have together and then seamlessly trying to you know, provide that at a real time to, to the clinicians uh, because uh, I think time is key and everything is uh, very sensitive, time sensitive and also uh, must be very secure in, in our system. So I think these are all things that we need to think about as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jensen. So the next question, uh, either Mikko or Tian, uh, Tian Yi can take this. So can you share more about your healthcare administration scholarship journey? Mm, maybe I can go first. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess healthcare administration is um, maybe in a sense also um, not something that uh, you would see at be an undergraduate or maybe even like at the JC or poly level really as a thing that you specialize in, right? So um, I would say that um, it has definitely been somewhat of a steep learning curve. Like, I mean, um, entering AIC as a, in, in a sense, more or less a healthcare administrator. Lah. So um, I think a lot of this involves, um, which was probably mentioned before also, um, a lot of actually cross collaborations. Um, understanding, for example, some of our clinical colleagues um, and the different disciplines. So, for example, like, like just, just within like my um, division itself, we do have people who are like medical social workers by training, um, physiotherapists, occupational therapists. And I think when coming together to actually really look at some of the projects that um, we try to drive um, at a sector level at AIC, it's about trying to see how um, we can actually um, get all of these views together um, and to put forward certain programs that um, could actually benefit clients uh, in, in the community. So I would say that um, healthcare administration is definitely something that um, is challenging, might, might not be everyone's cup of tea in a sense, um, but at the same time, I think um, it also draws on a lot of skills that um, were kind of uh, somewhat covered at, in terms of like soft skills um, in the in, in your education journey. La. So things such as, for example, project um, project management, um, ability to manage timelines, that kind of thing. Um, I would see these as really um, core skill sets as someone who uh, is considering entering healthcare administration. Thanks, Miko. Uh, I can add in about the little part of the scholarship journey. So as part of SGIS under the uh, MOHH scholarship, right? Actually, I come into contact as I managed to uh, have uh, experience with like other scholars, but because like healthcare administration is the smaller circle, right? And then the rest are all like healthcare professionals. We are the little minority, and then they are always talking about like healthcare stuff, like the future of like, uh, like what they do and like how how the um. Me, how the ministers like plan for like the healthcare 10 years ahead that kind of thing so most of the time um it's not really so much about the administration part but I find out a lot more about the healthcare sector la, from all these um, seminars that the um, MOHH help us to organize as like scholars to like get together and everything so it has been like a really eye-opening experience because like other than this part, right, I don't ever get to learn about like the healthcare sector in school or like otherwise it's, it's, a, it's a less um, talked about uh, industry like it, like before COVID, right, it's like I don't really see much of it. Lah. And then lucky like COVID like 
not so lucky <laughs> like Sean some light on on like our healthcare professionals who are really like them brave and like like very selfless lah. so like I think it's it's pretty interesting like I don't uh I mean if there's one thing that I regret I hope I had wish that I participated in more stuff because they have a lot of um as scholars right there's like then an ex school and then they always um have like little uh get together sessions or like um those kind of like dialect classes because like nurses like they want to learn like dialects and everything right to like talk to like elderly and everything so they have a lot of those kind of programs yeah if only I made time for them but then I didn't like and it was like midterm so like my year three or four I was doing like more internship stuff so I didn't have the chance to but as a scholar like I think it's quite interesting mm. Thank you so much. So we'll come to the last question. So this last question is for everyone. Um, could you please share some words of advice or some words of wisdom to students who are looking at joining healthcare, specifically in the health tech sector? So maybe we can get Eugene to start first. Yeah, okay. I would say for nursing, um, as what most of us mentioned, so it's not something that you actually learn in your JC time or even your uh, nursing degree time because um, this is still very niche. Um, the focus is more still on your actually healthcare and clinical skills. So for, in fact, every one of us at SGH Nursing Informatics, we actually do not have any uh, technological backgrounds. We are all trained in say diploma in nursing, degree in nursing, advanced diploma in nursing. So I think that's where our strength is. We actually mainly advise on the nursing workflow aspect to work with the nurses as well as the technology stuff to actually um, produce what we do, such as the electronic medical records or the MDI and so on and so forth. So it's more of like, we need to be very rooted in our nursing workflows and such be it your degree time, student time, or your working time during your initial few years, you have to ensure that you are very rooted as a nurse before you can actually step up to this uh, nursing informatics role and actually be involved in health tech. Thank you. Thanks, Eugene. Uh, Chen, Chen Zhen, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, I think the key thing is um, to have an open mind and um, to, in a sense, when I think take the initiative to, you know, read up more online first and really understand if, uh, uh, in a sense, in a sense, the, the health, the health tech, what it encompasses is usually, actually, because, the thing is that when we are when we're working there, there's really a lot of uh, things to know and to understand, but you must understand that you cannot know everything. That's why we have we work with so many different partners and you know the clinicians themselves. So I think it's okay if you feel overwhelmed. But I think it's more for breaking down to the smaller pieces. Lah. So for example, when you have when you in need of help, uh, uh really don't really understand a certain part because of the clinical aspect is a bit difficult to understand it's always okay to reach out to the users to clarify and you know it's always better to ask more questions than to assume whenever we develop this kind of technologies I think that's um, the, the key thing when you enter but of course um, before you enter to is to find out uh, like for example joining these kind of sessions or even talking to people who are already in a row to, to find out about more of their day-to-day -day and um, how, whether that is something that would be your cup of tea. I think most importantly is to know that you know it's aligned with a right fit for you, uh, in terms of your career aspirations or even your, uh, you know whether in a sense that's something you want to to venture into in terms of your technical skill sets or something like that. I think once you are you are sure about that for yourself, it will be uh it, it will be actually quite a fulfilling journey for you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, my turn to share. Uh, I feel that uh, for health tech, right, it's actually a very new and niche area. There's, a, there's um, very few countries that are even like focusing so much on like delivering good and uh, better health for like the whole nation and like not say like for profit or whatever, it's like really for the general public's health. So in this sense, like, as we are at the forefront, right, there's a lot of, like, innovation going on and, like, so much to take care of. Like, there's not much um, uh, focus on, like, uh, like whatever, like, 
uh, I don't know how to say like profit or whatever. It's just like you have a lot of space to innovate and like try to like better like this industry and like in this like digital transformation era, right? I think there's a lot to learn and always keep an open mind because like health tech, there's so many like disciplines here. Like you are probably only like in one area and then you don't like for me I, I i'm in the tech area i never knew what the nurses wanted you know like i, ne- I never knew like what the processes are like for other people like the other users in like who i interact daily in my in the very same project so i think like you must keep an open mind like, to like uh, fully encompass everything and like, understand like what you are doing and like you know derive meaning from it Mm, I'll go next. Yeah. So um in terms of words of advice, um, there are two things that, that I guess I, I can think of. So um firstly, uh like I think as, as what a lot of the other speakers have shared, like health tech is definitely still um quite a new and emerging area. So I would say that for anyone who's interested in it, um definitely keep yourself informed of like what are some of the new initiatives that are going out. Um, not just maybe like not and not limited to just maybe the local healthcare setting. Also, like we could always take a look at what are some of the other countries doing. Um, what are they piloting? What are they pioneering? I think those are always um kind of interesting ideas. Um, that could probably spark off in the innovation also la, Um, for us, and then um secondly, uh, I would think also that um sometimes maybe uh we do tend to overlook some of the soft skills that that might be needed. Um, when it comes to to doing um the the job itself, right? Um, so I would say uh, for anyone in, interested in it, like maybe still in your schooling years or something, um, could also consider maybe looking at some of the more like um, design thinking related principles, um, courses, um, process innovation related kind of things. I think these are definitely um, skill sets that would still be helpful uh, if, if, if you are looking at um, deepening um, your expertise in health tech. Yep. Uh, okay, I'll go next. Uh, I think if you look at this word health tech, right, it's composed of two parts. Lah. So you've got a healthcare part, uh, which uh, I think stands for that desire to uh, want to help others, uh, which is uh, a lot of, um, you know, the speakers have expressed it, you know, and then there's the technology part, like that, uh, the hard skills, the technical side of it. And I think my advice to, um, you know, someone who's actually just setting out, uh, I think if you are here today, uh, I guess you already have the desire to want to help, but it's about being clear of where your strengths lie and how you use these strengths to um, help others in healthcare. So in healthcare, you can do it in different ways. So you can either contribute um, clinically by being out there on the ground, or for someone who, you know, if you feel that maybe that's not uh, your cup of tea, but your strengths rather lie in your know, systems or uh, developing systems uh, in, in technology, then I think you will find that a career in health tech uh, would actually help to give you the fulfillment uh, in those two areas. So as in not just being in uh, terms of able to help someone and derive meaning from that, but using uh, what you're good at uh, in terms of the systems to uh, bridge the gap and actually meet some of the human uh, aspects of the uh, whole thing. Uh, I think maybe I'll just end off by sharing a little bit of how I uh, got into this profession uh, when back when I was uh, 18. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I came from a very typical JC background and then, uh, you know, as in quite a typical Singaporean as in what's next as in those at time the careers are you know either medicine dentistry uh, you want to be a lawyer or maybe in science uh, so uh, I, I was actually uh, I, I knew I was quite strong in systems in terms of like hands-on practical work um, in terms of um, making things uh, and sometimes I wondered like you know as in how can I use these um, hard skills to actually make a difference uh, and give back um, to society and when I chance on um, P&O uh, because this profession is actually quite technical in itself uh, it's actually quite uh, almost like uh, D&T but in a healthcare context so when I uh, came across that then I felt that look as in this uh, this is healthcare this is technology and it marries um, the two fields very well and that was where I, I found my meaning and I felt I could contribute the most uh, uh, meaningfully so I think to um, all those who are present today if uh, those are my words of uh, advice to you. Uh, as in, uh, this is a field that would really um, help to uh, bring those two halves, the human half, as well as the, uh, the technical, as in the hard skill side of it, where you can contribute meaningfully um, to make a difference in others' lives. Thank you so much, speakers, for your insightful sharing and also ask, um, answering all the Q&As. So now we have come to the end of this session. Um, speakers, you may take your leave. Thank you so much. Um, so to all the attendees, we would like to remind everyone that we have a simple survey that is launched right after this session. 
So um, we will also be picking three of the survey's participants to win a $10 grab food voucher. So we have come to the end of day one and we are back tomorrow for day two at 2 p.m. So do join us for the Learn and Explore Medical Social Work, Nursing, Occupational Therapy and Physiotherapy session. So have a good day and thank you and we see you tomorrow.